And one of the first things I want to do is tell you a quick story, because this was in the book by another name in Why Hospitals Should Fly. But I used my stepson, Kathleen's son, who's a, a young man who's now uh, a pilot and a pretty good one, I think, going hopefully into the airlines later. When he was just in high school, he was out rough housing with some friends one day. He heard something snap, and, and he, had, he had broken uh, the clavicle on his chest, and, and his, his right arm was hanging down, and he was in pain. And they took him to the hospital, and I'll spare you all the details of the story, but it was in and out and in and out, and we can't find anything wrong with the x-ray, and his, his shoulder is hanging down. They can't find anything wrong on the x-ray, so therefore there is nothing wrong. They send him home in pain. They give him pain medication. Nobody can find anything else to do. About a year later, I think it's a little more than a year later, he's in college and he calls his mom up and says, Mom, my, my right arm has turned blue. I, I can hardly feel it. What should I do? And she says, get to the hospital immediately. Get to the emergency room. He gets to the emergency room and the doctor, this is over the mountains, so she's on the phone to the physician, and of course she's an accomplished nurse, says, I, it looks like somebody's got an invisible tourniquet on his arm. Well. Long story, somewhat shorter, he has a 10 centimeter blood clot that they finally find. Five doctors misdiagnosed this, didn't diagnose it, blew past it. And these are not bad doctors, these are good people. Every one of them. Matter of fact, Kathleen even knew a number of these doctors and trusted them. And they trusted themselves. They probably wouldn't have never thought that they would have gotten it wrong, but they did, five of them. Finally, one doctor asks a question of Tim. He says, tell me about that ultrasound again that they gave you. He said, well, they put the gel up here and they put the thing down here. And he says, ah, okay, we're going to send you up for another ultrasound. But this time, he makes it very specifically clear that they've got to put the gel way up here and they've got to do the ultrasound on the upper shoulder. And the results are a 10 centimeter blood clot sitting right there, ready to rush, rush into the lungs and probably kill him the instant it does. They send him upstairs to a room. They put a big sign on the bed. Do not put a blood pressure cuff on the right arm. Kathleen is very relieved. She goes up to the room, she goes to the restroom, and is coming out only to find a foreign nurse, not even an RN, putting a blood pressure cuff on his upper right arm and getting ready to squeeze the bulb, which would have probably killed him almost certainly. In the story, we went ahead and killed him off. His brothers had fun with that. He says, yeah, they killed you off in the book. Uh, <laughs> but the point is, None of us are safe. There is no doctor in this country that is safe, no nurse that is safe, as long as we have a non-system that can't get it right. And why can't we get it right if we aren't dealing with bad people? Because it is a cottage industry. There was a wonderful paper about two years ago in New England Journal of Medicine, I think it was February 26th of, uh, of 2009, uh, and it was a who's who of medicine. And I think Lucian is also one of the uh, authors of that. But basically it said, cottage industry to post-industrial care. And it really outlines it. Just as Lucian said earlier, we have for the last 150 years trained people for the same period of time. Every doctor in this room, every doctor out there has been trained for a previous century. And as Lucian said, it's the 19th, not even the 20th. And that is not a dishonorable statement to say that we are training you to be that individual out on the prairie in somebody's cabin at 2 a.m. in the morning in a storm when you are the only thing standing between that patient and oblivion. And guess what? There are no helicopters to come pluck you out of there. There are no desk references. There are no blackberries or droids. It's just what you've got in your head and your heart that's standing between that patient and oblivion. That's the way we still train. And the idiocy of this, and it is idiocy when you really look at it, when you pull the lens back, is that we have these massive structures called hospitals with wonderful people and wonderful parts, like Halverson said, wonderful parts, just not a system. We have to train docs to come into the 21st century and lead teams, not just teams, but collegial interactive teams, and that's one of our major problems, is we have not learned how to do that. Now, I, you know, I, I do come from the aviation industry. I'm not a doctor. I don't play one on television, as the old joke goes, but I've been in the community 21 years now, so, you know, I, I do feel very much a part of it. And I have to tell you that I know that a lot of people have gotten very tired of hearing about aviation. Aviation is at a lower level of complexity than health care. I mean, let's get that one on the table. Have you ever walked into one of our airplanes, maybe out here at DCA or out at Dulles, and, and you walked in, you looked to the left, the cockpit door was open, and there are a couple of male pilots up there looking back at you with that silly, hi girls, I fly jets grin. 
well, we want you to be really impressed with the complexity of the dials and the gauges and all the prowess required. It's really pretty simple. Get the engine started, get it out on the runway, get up on a fair speed, grab the yoke and pull. The houses get smaller. If you push, the houses get larger. It's a very straightforward thing. <laughs> Nowhere near as complex as healthcare. <laughs>